And let's pray the prayer of Jeremiah 29, where Jeremiah was telling the people as they were going into captivity to pray for the peace of the city. Father, I pray that you would help us today to hear your word, to understand your word, to be encouraged by your word. We do ask that you would be glorified. That is our chief concern, that all the attention would be brought to you. And Father, we know that you are sovereign and you are working in all things through all things. And no matter what happens, Father, we pray that you would be glorified. We also pray for the peace of our city and our state and our nation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I told you you're going to need your Bibles. So if you have your Bibles, let's begin in Jude chapter, uh, well, Jude. Let's begin in Jude. And you should have received the little handout um, when you came in, or Eric was my good emanuensis uh, here this morning, my good usher. And if you do not have a copy of that, uh, you can raise your hand. Anybody need a copy of that? Because I want you to take some notes. Now, before we get to what's on that page, front and back, there's some things that I want to share with us uh, in preparation for that. So, but let's begin in Jude, verse 1. Here's what the Word of God says. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept by or for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend, to earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God, of our God, into sensuality, promiscuousness, and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Well, let's begin there. Whenever a pastor is praying about what to preach, I want to to let you in on that process. The series that we're doing through Jude did not come in a canned email from Lifeway. That's not how sermons are produced. The way sermons and series ought to be produced is the pastor, and sometimes in consultation even with staff, pray about where the church is and what we think we need to hear, including myself. And so a few months ago, when we landed on the book of little book of Jude, 25 verses, and we begin to pray through this process, little did I know that God in His sovereignty, aren't you glad that God is providentially sovereign over all things? Little did I know that we would need to hear the word of Jude more than you could ever imagine. That little verse there, look in verse 3, Jude uh, says, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation. I wanted to write to you, you believers, and rejoice in how God has saved us to kind of rehearse for them what... um, Keith has just mentioned that we are sinful, we can't keep the law, Christ has come on a rescue mission to rescue us. But like Jude, Jude says, but I, I have learned that there are people who have crept in among you, and because of that, I'm calling you to earnestly contend for the faith. Not, not your faith, not my faith. This, the word faith here is not used in a in, as a verb, as an action. It's not, a, it's not like your faith. We are saved by faith. I do have faith. But here, Jude is talking about the content of the faith. Notice the definite article. I want you to contend for the faith. That is, I want you to contend 
for what you believe and, as we're going to find out in the book of Jude, all the things that are connected with that. Sometimes when we preach the gospel, we only think that it's Christ died for our sins, He was raised, and we are saved. Well, that's true. But the gospel has impact on how we live as families, how I am a father, a mother, a kid, a worker. There are gospel implications. Now, you would have to be living under a rock to not know that things have been going on in our country. Have you all noticed that? And the things that have happened this past week have, have and, and the things that have been contended for, things that are of concern to me, I'll just talk about myself, things that are concerned to me, um, probably to you, things that I think are biblical convictions, have now been put behind the eight ball, if you will. Um, what happened this past week um, probably will end up in some trying to limit speech, association, freedom of religious worship, anybody who has an opinion that is biblical, traditional, conservative, will now be lumped together with people who don't keep the law. And that's a sad thing. By the way, that's coming. Can I get a witness on that? Is that is coming. So if there were ever a time for us to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the church, to the saints, it is now. So I want to, I want to just announce a goal here that I have for our church. I, would, I want, and, and we, are this, we are this in many ways, I want Inglewood Baptist Church to be an oasis of truth, grace, and joy. Can I get a witness on this? The world is going to, is getting crazy and is getting crazier, and it's not going to get better. Now, I know what you're thinking. Pastor, I've been praying for revival. Well, I am too. And it's entirely, it's entirely possible. I would love for us to have a revival in our country from coast to coast. But you can do two things at the same time. Can you do two things at the same time? You can. You can simultaneously be realistic about what's happening and pray for revival. So if there were ever a time for us to contend for the faith, and every truth that comes out of that, it's now. No time for spiritual passiveness. But now what does that mean? Well, let's go to another verse, if you will. Let's go to James chapter 1. And for those of you who were watching Wednesday night... Um, you probably saw a little bit of this, but let's go to James. You say, well, pastor, I, I want to do what Jude says. I want to contend. I'm, 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 I'm really uh, upset. I feel like somebody stole my, my church. Somebody stole my country. Somebody stole everything that's valuable to me. I'm red hot with anger. Well, let's look at James chapter 1 and verse 19. Here's what James says. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak, slow to anger. An underline verse 20. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Now get that? You see them in verse 20? We are to contend, but anger never accomplishes the righteousness of God. Now, I know what you're thinking. All of you are looking at it this way. Well, pastor, I am angry. There's a lot to be angry about. What about this thing called righteous indignation? I see a wrong, I see a sin, 
I see a direction of my family. I see a direction of my nation. I see a direction of my city. Don't we have a right to be angry? Well, we'll get to that. But I just want to lay down this principle that the anger of a person, the anger in families, the anger in church, the anger in a city, and the anger in a nation will never ultimately accomplish God's purposes. Never. Well, I know what you're thinking. I'm glad you asked this. Here's this second verse. Look at John chapter 18. Look at John chapter 18. John chapter 18. So here's what we got to remember, that our anger and our concerns over things, we must also remember that ultimately we are not building a kingdom of this world. Look at John 18, 36. Or let's actually begin in verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters. Jesus has been arrested. He's on trial. Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? In other words, I'm not involved in your theological controversies. I don't know who you are. That's why I'm asking you. Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to, the, to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, look at verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. So here's the second principle I want to give you before we get back to Jude. We have all these concerns that we have, right? I could give you a whole list. I'll do that. For me, abortion is not a political issue. It's the murder of an unborn child. I believe that there are only two sexes, male and female. And that marriage is only between a man and a woman. That's not a political statement for me. That's biblical. I believe that God has created government, Romans 13, to punish the evildoer and to reward good behavior. I believe that we ought to be free to speak, especially religiously, and hold our convictions. I believe that we ought to be free because the gospel sets us free, we are to be responsibly free in other places. I do not believe that government is the end-all, be-all of every question and problem that we have. I believe that Scripture teaches that people are personally responsible and accountable for their behaviors. I believe that a mom and dad, by what the Word of God says, ought to have the first right to parent their children according to the dictates of their conscience and biblical truth. Should I go on? Can I get a witness on this stuff? So the, these are the things that, 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 I, that are my convictions, not because I pulled them out of the air, not because they're a part of a political party, but because they're in the book. They're in the book. But, but here's what I've got to remember. As a Christian... The ultimate kingdom I am helping build is the kingdom of God. Now, I'm really glad when the things of the kingdom of God line up with the kingdom of this world that I live in. Boy, that's really cool. And if you look at history, there are times, that, there are moments in history where the convictions of a biblical Christian are fairly, fairly commensurate with the convictions of a culture. And in the United States of America, we've had it pretty good for a long time. We've had a really good run for about 350 years. But over the last 50 or 60 years, brothers and sisters, the convictions of a biblical Christian and the convictions of a nation that has unhitched itself from God have now started to part ways. Or, 
I, am I, I think I'm right in this. This is my proposition to you this morning. And here's the choice. W which way am I going to go? Now, I would love for those things to get closer back together. And I can work for that and pray for that, but ultimately, if, if made a choice, I'm a kingdom guy. I'm a kingdom guy with kingdom convictions, and therefore I fight the way a kingdom guy does. So, this leads me to my third verse. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Here Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And he's talking here about battles. And I'll just abbreviate this. Look, look in verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 10. Though we walk in the flesh, oh, there's a lot that could be put in that category. We, we live in the flesh, right? When you became a Christian, you were adopted, moved into the kingdom of God. But guess what? You still have this old flesh. Anybody in here have to deal with your flesh? We all do. You will until you die. You'll be like Paul says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. That's, this is constant war. There's a constant war in between, and that's kind of normal. We'll have that until we die, and then not only will, be, will we not only have the, the victory over sin, even the presence of sin. Can you imagine living in heaven where there, we're absent the presence of sin? So we live in the flesh, and, and that means... We live in a world that's fleshly. You have processes. You have stop signs. Why do you have stop signs? We have, my wife has reminded, we have speed limit signs. What's that there for? Because we live in the flesh. We, we live in this world. We, we can't escape this world. So, so we live in this world. We, we happen to live in a country that has rules and obligations and supposedly a constitution. We live in the flesh. Now the temptation here is to war like the flesh. But what does Paul say? Look in verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, we don't wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have mighty power, divine power to destroy strongholds. And we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God to take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. So, so, so here's, let me put this together and then we're going to go back to Jude because there's a really key important and I'll be done, amen? Last week I preached too long and all the child care workers were cursing under their breath. Can I get a witness on that? I wish that guy would shut up up there. So, we have all these concerns, biblical convictions, and it doesn't seem like it's going that way. And some people, because it's not going that way, have, have, have let their anger rise up in them. Now, there's nothing wrong with being angry, because we're going to go back to a verse here in just a minute about anger. But anger has caused them to go so far that violence only begots violence. And anger never accomplishes the righteousness of God. You ever, you ever met anybody that was won into the kingdom of God by being angry? Hey, I want to give you, I want, to, I want you to come to Christ because I'm angry. And we are got to be reminded that even Jesus, now these, Jesus is on trial in John 18. Blood dripping down his face, wrongly accused. You're talking about injustice, a kangaroo court. They can't get their charges to line up. Is he a heretic? 
Is he an insurrectionist? Who is this? Are you a king? Jesus said, if I was a king of this world, you better believe for a minute that when Peter pulled his sword out in the garden, I would have not told him to put it up. I would have gotten one myself. But my kingdom is not of this world. Well, pastor, what are we supposed to do? Well, we have weapons. Oh, these silly weapons. No, 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 no. These, these are mighty weapons. These are mighty weapons. These weapons are the weapons of truth. Let me ask you a question. Do you know the truth? When you show up at the parent-teacher conference, when you go to the school board meeting, when you go to the meeting, when you're with your family, do you know the truth? See, we don't think the weapons that God has given us are strong enough because we don't know the depth and the breadth and the dimension of the weapons that He's given us. Like truth and righteousness and prayer and gospel and righteous living. So these are weapons that we have. You want to write in your footnote, in your notes, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 20, where Paul kind of picks up this theme of weapons, and he says that we're not in a battle against flesh and blood. We're in a battle that's spiritual in the heavenlies. There are demonic forces behind this. So then he goes to the armor of God. Well, let's go back to Jude. Open your Bibles back to Jude. How does Jude encourage his readers to contend for the faith? Now, this is where I want you to pull your outline out. And I'm probably going to get myself in trouble, but here we go. Would you please look at the first two verses? Because here's what Jude is going to argue. Now, listen very carefully. Jude is going to argue... That in order for us to contend for the faith, in order for us to enter into the battle, in order for us to be a soldier, if you will, in the army of God's kingdom, you must know who you are. You, you must know not only who you are, but, but what you believe. I'm absolutely astonished. There, there have been a few times in my life where I've gotten into a debate face to face. And one of the things I've learned about some enemies of the cross is once you get past their name calling, they don't even know what they believe. And that's true of many Christians. We, we, we just know something's wrong. We, we know something's upside down. We know that that's not right. But we couldn't give you one scripture verse or one biblical argument about why it's wrong and why it ought not to be that way. And Jude, whether you know it or not, all of these introductions, these little but don't read past the introduction. You know, when we write a letter or an email or a text or whatever, we say, we don't even say dear. Dear John, you ever gotten a Dear John letter? We just write, hey, you. But not so in the Bible. And in these introductions are loaded all kinds of things. So there's two, two ways that Jude identifies himself and the people that he is writing to. And, and I want you to understand that in the way he introduces himself and his audience, we're going to find our identity. Okay, so let me read these two verses to you again. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept by Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So there's two ways he identifies himself. So look on your outline. He identifies himself in a, in a natural way. What I'm calling just a normal, natural way. So he uses words like, I got a name. You got a name? You may have been named after me. He said, Jew. We have two names here. We have Jude and James. We, we have a relationship. He, he says there's a brother. 
He says, I'm a brother of James. Now, the Jude here is the half-brother of Jesus along with James. How would you like to have Jesus in your family? And so before, Jesus is the firstborn, born of a virgin. Joseph is the adopted father. But after Jesus is born, according to Matthew 13, 55, Mary had a bunch of other children, and it names them. You can go look at that later. And it names them. It names all the men, doesn't name all the women, but it names Jude and James. And James ended up being pastor of the, of the mega church in, 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 uh, in Jerusalem, and Jude ended up being kind of an itinerant evangelist, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and he, he uses these natural ways to identify himself. He said, I've, I've got a name, I've got relationships, and, 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 and these are important. But you have to be careful here. Uh, he was a Jew, which means that he was probably an olive-skinned person, probably very dark-complected, dark hair, spoke with an accent. He wasn't from South Tennessee. Now, here's where you have to be careful, and here's where the world has gone mad. We have solely identified who we are by the color of our skin. Now, all of a sudden, whiteness matters, and blackness matters, and ethnicity matters. That's why we have things like critical race theory and identity politics, and we're all put in groups be careful if you solely identify yourselves in these natural ways because they're always changing, aren't they? I mean, if you ask somebody who they are, well, I'm a wife, here's my husband. What happens when your husband dies or your wife dies? Or I'm a, I knew one time a guy that worked at Ford Motor Plant. He was a Ford guy, Ford Ford jeans. I don't even know where he got all the clothes. He said, I got these jeans from Ford, shirt from Ford, drove a Ford. If you drove anything else, he didn't like you. And when he was getting ready to retire, I asked him one time, I said, once you retire, will you cease to exist? He looked at me like, what? I said, you're, all of your identity is in, it's in good. I'm glad you were a good worker for all those years. But is that who you really are? What happens when you get the pink slip or your spouse dies or your job changes? You see, brothers and sisters, these are important ways to identify ourselves, and we are thankful for them. I appreciate people's ethnic background and, and all of those things, and we have people in our church, Hispanics and people that are from different cultural backgrounds, but brothers and sisters, that is not the sum and substance of who you and I are. And if we fight the battles and contend for the gospel that God wants us to do, and we make it that your identity is your ethnicity or your skin color or your education, we lose every time. I personally don't care what color you are. Neither does God. God is no respecter of persons. He is no respecter. It doesn't matter what education you have. As the old saying goes, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. So when we say, hey, who are you? I, I, I don't apologize for saying I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather of the three of the smartest, most brilliant grandchildren you've ever seen in your life. Sorry, you missed out. I, I, I am this, I'm that, but I know I know that those things change. Those things are not as stable as we might think. Well, how do we identify ourselves? I'm glad you asked. Because he tells us that as well. Here we go. Look what he says. In verse 1, Jude says that I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. In fact, in some of your translations it says slave. That's actually the correct term. You know what Jude and James are both saying? I, I may have a name. I may have an ethnicity. I may have a skin color. I may have a background. But I am owned by Jesus Christ. 
And when you and I came to faith in Jesus Christ, he became the master and we are the servant. Can I get a witness on this? My identity ultimately is had in Jesus Christ. Let me give you proof of this. In Revelation 5 and in Revelation 7, you remember when it says that on that great day we'll stand before the throne and there'll be people from every tongue and every tribe and every nation, every ethnos. So God is fully aware of what color you are and where you're from. My heritage is German. Yours might be English or whatever it is. But you ever notice in that text that when we are, when the great getting up morning and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we'll be standing before the throne of God, they don't look at each other and say, oh, look at you and look at you and look at you and, and, and I guess you're here because of your skin color, your ethnicity. What do they do? All of these people look one place. They look to the Lamb who is on the throne, who shed his blood to redeem people no matter what their skin color is, no matter where they come from. Brothers and sisters, Jude said, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know really who I am, he's the owner. I'm the property. He's the leader. I'm the follower. He's the redeemer. I'm the redeemed. Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness on that? It's a truth. Here's the second thing that he says. Look what he says in verse 1. He says, to those who are called, don't run past this. When you were saved, God called you. Look on your outline. There are three basic calls in Scripture. I don't have time to go through all these very much, but first there's the call to salvation. Repent and believe. Then there's the call to sanctification. That's the, that's the biblical word that talks about growth. 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Sanctification is, is the Greek word for holiness in, in the Bible. In the, in the Old Testament. And we're, we're, we're not only called to be saved, but we're called to be ever more increasingly, every day, to become more and more like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the process of sanctification. And then we're called to serve. We're just called to serve. Well, Pastor, you're, you're called to preach, but I'm not called. No, it, listen, when you got saved, you got called. Not only to salvation, but to end sanctification, that God called you to serve. The called. The called. I was thinking about that calling, and right now we're zoned in on our country. Do you know that they're rounding up pastors in China right now? There's another heavy uh, movement by the government. Over in China, they can do facial recognition. Everything you buy can track down who you are and where you live. And they're using that to track down pastors and Christians. But guess what? The Chinese government doesn't get to define who you are, nor does America's government get to define who you are. You are a servant of Jesus Christ. And you and I have been called, and you can't take that from me. That's my identity. A servant called. Look at the next thing. He says, I'm beloved. Look in verse 1. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father. I love that, how deep the Father's love. God loves you. God cares for you. He loves you more than you'll ever know. He loves you more than you'll ever know. That God loves you. And then look at the next thing. He says, you're, you're kept. You're kept. You remember what Jesus said in John 17, 12? He's praying to the Father, and he said, Father, all of these 
all of these little lambs that you gave me, I've not lost any of them. You see, here at Inglewood Baptist Church, our statement of faith, we believe in the security of the believer, the perseverance of the saints. Now, you've got to truly be saved to be kept. God doesn't keep unbelievers. But if you have truly repented of your sins and trusted Christ, you can never be lost. Can I get a witness on that? Never be lost. I love the image. He says, you put them in my hand. You put them in my hand and nothing can take them out of my hand. We're kept by Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ. And then finally, we're blessed. Look what it says. May mercy, peace, and love. Mercy, peace, and love. You're blessed with it. Now, brothers and sisters, this is who we are. This is the position from which we fight and struggle. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Let me tell you what it means. I'm going to give you an example. You don't have to go. You can look at this later. But in Acts 17, I close with this illustration. In Acts 17, after Paul is converted on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, he begins to preach the gospel. And he doesn't, he's behind enemy lines. They're, they're, you know, we, we want our government to support our freedoms of, you know, religious liberty and freedom of speech and the freedom of assembly and the freedom of association, all these things that we've taken for granted, which are under threat. They didn't have that. Paul didn't have that. The Roman government did not have the Constitution of the United States of America. I mean, you could have your head cut off for preaching the gospel, and there were people that that happened to. You know what Paul's pattern was? He, every city he went into, every city he went into, he, he would do two things. He would go to the secular place and the, secu- the sacred place. You, you mark it down. He would go to the sacred place, and it says, well, he'd show up at the synagogue. And he'd go to the synagogue, and there in the synagogue, he would preach the gospel. Because they, they had never heard it before. All these Jews at the synagogue would meet, and they'd roll out the Torah, and they'd, you know, uh, I've, I've been to a, a Jewish service uh, few years ago, and they bring out the Torah and walk it around and then read from it and unscroll it and then put it back in the box, and they have their phylacteries on and all this stuff, and, and if you're Hasidic Jews, they'll, they don't cut their hair and they wear the, they wear all the, the yarmulke and all this stuff, and, and they're just, they're, and Paul would go into the, the sacred places and he would preach the gospel. And then you know what he would do? He would find the secular places. He'd go into the marketplace. He'd go up on Mars Hill. And in Acts 17, this is exactly what he does. There's a place there called the Oropagus in this city where he would go in and and there they would have these philosophical debates and they would have ideas exchanging. And and Paul goes up there and he doesn't go up there with a hammer. He doesn't go up there with anger. What he does is he goes up there and you know what he sees? It says, when I was in the city, my heart was moved because of all the idols. Brothers and sisters, is your heart not moved today? It ought to be. And what does he do? He goes into, he goes up on this place, and he's unafraid, and he doesn't keep his mouth shut, but he speaks to them, even really in their own language. Apparently, they had altars all around, all to the gods Zeus, all these gods, these Greek gods, and just to cover their bases. They had an altar over here to the unknown God in case they discovered one that they hadn't yet. And what does Paul do? You know what he says? I see, people, that you are very religious. I see that you're very religious. And I'm here to proclaim to you not only the unknown God, but I'm here to proclaim to you the only wise God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he preaches the gospel. He doesn't back down, shut down, shut up, move over. 
but he's not belligerent, he's not ugly. He just goes in there with truth and grace and preaches. And you know, there were three responses. Some people called him a babbler. Do you know there's a Greek word for they used? Let me, I'm going to give you, you know Greek better than you think you do. You know what the word they called him? They said, what is this babbler saying? Here's an interpretation of that word. It is. It, it's a nonsense word. You ever use a nonsense word? Doesn't make any sense to anybody but you and your husband. I can see you all looking at each other. It's a, it's a, it said, what is this nonsense, this guy's? So, brothers and sisters, as we move in this world that's going the wrong way, and yet we take the weapon of truth and the weapon of grace and prayer and righteousness, and we walk into the sacred places and we walk into the secular places, do not be surprised if they think you're just a babbler. What nonsense. What absolute nonsense that we're preaching that Jesus is the only way to be saved. That one must humble themselves before a righteous God and repent of their sins and trust Jesus as their Savior. That's nonsense. But preach it anyway. The second response was, there were people who believed. There were people who believed. My heart was full of joy when the pastor of the Hispanic church came into my office this morning. His name's Buddy. You, some of you met him. He said, Pastor, during this season of COVID, we've had people come to faith in Christ. We need to baptize them. Can we use your baptistry? I said, no, we don't do that around here. I, that's not what I said. I looked at him and I said, Buddy, isn't it great to know that not even a virus can shut down the business of God? So there were some who believed. And then there was a third group. They said, hey, we'll, we'll hear you again on this. We want to know more. Isn't that what we've discovered? Haven't you and I discovered that as we go into this world, knowing who we are, that when we preach the gospel, there will be some who will not get it, don't want it, will reject it, are angry about it. There are some who will believe. Many who will believe. And then there will be some, that friend of yours, that cousin of yours, that relative of yours, that schoolmate of yours, who will say, let's keep talking. Let's keep talking. You see, brothers and sisters, if there were ever a time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to stand up with a heart of love, a spine of steel, a mouth filled with grace and truth, if there were ever a time, it is time for us to be that church. And you know, my prayer is that we would be an oasis, that while the wheels are coming off in this fair country of ours, it seems like, that this would be a place, now listen, this would be a place of truth, grace, and joy. I would love it if visitors come and say, there's something wrong with those people up there. What do you mean? Well, they just seem, they seem settled. They don't seem unnerved. They, they know what's going on, but they they, they've had such confidence in their God that, that they live by grace. They're not afraid to speak the truth. And they're full of joy. Let us be that church. Let us contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this call that you have given us to contend for the faith would not be grounded in anger or bitterness or vengeance, but it would be grounded in the gospel itself. Now, Lord, this doesn't mean that we have to be quiet or a pacifist in the sense that we just kind of say, well, I guess just 
let things move on, whatever. But Lord, we, we boldly and humbly walk into the, the sacred places. And what that means, Lord, is we preach the gospel to each other in this church. We remind each other of the truth that is eternal. It also means that when we're in those secular places, that we're not going to be silent. We're going to take truth and grace and even our joy. And we're going to preach the gospel and live the gospel and all that that means for our families and where we work and where we play. And Lord, I, I've said it before, but only you can do this. I pray that you would make us an oasis where people can find truth and grace and joy. Would you stand where you are, please? And my invitation to you is very simple this morning. As you are in prayer, if you bow your heads, and I just want to ask you, do you know the Lord? Is he your master? Is he your Lord? Would you trust him today? Turn from your sin. Just say, Lord, I... I'm a sinner, I'm broken, I'm, I need you. And to turn to him by faith. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you his child? Would you offer yourself to him now? Just surrender yourself. If you've prayed that prayer of commitment, if you've made that commitment to your heart, after we finish here in just a few minutes, would you come and let me know? I would love to pray with you, open the scripture with you, give you more information about how you might grow in Christ and where you go next. And then, dear Christian, I know <laughs> that we have been in a very difficult season for the last several, several months. But I am indeed thankful that you've been so faithful. And I know many of you are facing challenges where you work, in your family. And I just want to pray for you that God would make you a person of grace and truth and joy. Father, I know that you're looking down upon us, not only looking down, but you're among us. The precious people in this worship center and those who are watching, who cannot be here today, but nevertheless are watching, that are part of us. Lord, I am indeed grateful that many in their homes, in their, among their friendships, where they work, they're doing the hard work of often standing alone um, with convictions and truth. And Lord, I just pray that you'd be merciful to us and give us strength. And I pray that as a church, as a gathered church, that when we gather, we would be a place of grace and truth and joy, and that we'd encourage each other in this, in this sometimes difficult journey called the Christian life and um, and Lord we, we thank you that in the end you get the victory you get the victory we get the benefit and uh, thank you and Lord we do pray for our nation we pray that if you would be merciful to us all the conditions seem right for you to pour out your spirit Lord people are looking and searching for an answer their whole world has been shattered lives have been um, disrupted and I pray that if you might 
if you might be merciful to us. Father, we don't deserve it. We have been a wicked nation, not just for years. And yet, Lord, you put a remnant in this nation who's been praying and praying and praying and praying. And Father, would you be so merciful to us that your spirit would be poured out and that pulpits and pews would be filled with preachers and believers who would rise up and uh, live out the gospel. And may it begin here, Lord. May it begin right here. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen. You give the Lord a praise offering this morning, amen. Well, as we go from this place, we do have some folks that we want to pray for. Our, our chairman of our deacons, George Russell, and his wife, Vicki, have, have COVID.